Before we get started, I do want to reach out to all of you guys listening and um, ask a small favor. And that's if you guys could go online and rate and review this podcast. Your input is far more important than you could probably imagine. Uh, Much like Instagram, podcasts have algorithms and your reviews are a major contributor to helping these things grow. Uh, So if you don't mind, take two minutes and just rate and review the show. I would greatly appreciate it. Throughout COVID-19, I've recorded several podcasts in advance knowing they'd be spread out. And among that group was my recording back in the fall with today's guest, Yanto Barker. Yanto started the UK-based cycling apparel and accessories brand, LaCole, and how the brand was created is absolutely fascinating. Born in Wales, the child of hippies, and far from a life of means, Yanto was plucked by a local bike shop that quickly noticed his talent for riding bikes fast. This not only graced him with free product, but led him down the path that eventually found him traveling the world and riding with the likes of Sir Bradley Wiggins, the winner of the 2012 Tour de France. Yanto's story is certainly inspirational, but as well as one comprised of self-awareness and incredible clarity. Granted, hindsight is 2020. however it isn't often someone lets you cross that threshold in their personal story, whereas Yanto graciously grants us that access. For me, this conversation was a great experience navigating the waters of appreciation and humility, and Yanto shares what he defines as real strength. We then take a dive into marketing, including LaCole's digital strategy and the hows and whys it's quintessential to their business. I think you'll find his story to be uplifting and motivational, to say the least. I'm your host, Wesley Smith, and you're listening to the Standard Age Podcast. Yento. Hello, how's it going? Well, how are you? Good, thank you. So we usually start these things off with kind of like where you're born and kind of how you grew up. Um, what uh, what area of England are you from? Are you are you Welsh? I'm Welsh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So technically not England at all. Right. <laughs> at all, a little outpost uh, in the British Isles. Uh, on the side of England is Wales, and I was born on the west coast, so near the sea, uh, in a place called Machantleth. Okay. Very difficult to say and even harder to spell. Sure. Uh, that's the Gaelic language that obviously Welsh is derived from. But um, And also my name comes from Wales as well. That's why it's probably a little bit unusual to a lot of people. So yeah, that's where I was born. Cool. So what were, what were your folks into? Like uh, work-wise? My folks wise. were both hippies. Oh, really? Yeah. So total hippies. I come from very alternative background. Um, oddly, my grandparents were quite, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, but like my granddad was a banker and my other granddad is an architect. So very straight laced kind of families. And then both their children ran away from the cities um, and met each other in Wales, which is where I was born, obviously, and um, live and still live quite an alternative lifestyle. So not mainstream, not in the city, don't run standard jobs or anything like that. So Right. I've kind of run back to the city. I live in London and um, I live more like the generation that's, that skipped before. before yeah, certainly. Parents. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what, um, for example, what kind of music were you into as a kid as a result? I remember I, um, one of my first albums that I bought myself was a Queen album. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and I really like Freddie Mercury as a, as a performer. Like I have a huge amount of respect for someone who was just channeling so much energy into his performances. Like, I don't know why, but I'm not really a stage person. I'm not, I'm not like someone who likes the limelight in a particular way, but I just, I just really connected with, with him and like Brian May. I wanted to be a guitarist when I was young and, um, I really love the, I just love the music. So that was sort of my first sort of taste into buying my own music. Sure. So what got you into cycling? Well, I mean, it's a really simple story, really. I I come from a very poor background. Mm. Um, not that I need sympathy for it, but and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't starved as a kid or beaten or anything like that. But <laughs> we um, we were on the bread line in a very basic way, as in, it, you know, we would occasionally eat by candlelight because the electricity had run out because mm. the bill, you know, was an ongoing bill that hadn't been paid or whatever. And, um, you know, even meat was sort of a luxury, that kind of stuff. So when I was about 14, 13, 14, I started cycling um, and I went out on a ride with the local bike shop and they recognized 
that I had, you know, a little bit of strength and fitness and potential maybe. And I had basically done a couple of rides with a couple of mates from school and I dropped them fairly quickly. So like, I don't know, I just seemed to have a lot of energy and it worked for cycling. So when I connected with the bike shop, they started giving me stuff and I got my first jersey for free. So coming from somewhere where I could never have afforded that jersey, um, that was a really quite a big deal. And gave me a little bit of a taste for mm, if I'm good at something and people will give me stuff, then that's quite cool. <laughs> like, I, yeah. can, I can convert my energy into free stuff. That, that's good. So that's how it started. And it kind of went from there. And quite quickly, I was getting bikes and kit and, you know, flights around the world. And I was part of the GB setup at 17, racing with Bradley Wiggins, although he went in very different directions from, from that year onwards. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was the beginning. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Um, so I, I, I think I read somewhere you were semi-pro based in France. What part of France were you based out of? So I spent five seasons racing for French amateur teams, semi-pro teams. And uh, the first year was a place called Troyes, which is about 200 kilometers east of Paris. Um, I spent a year there. I remember, again, so like, I mean, a, probably a common theme of my life and most of my adulthood is I've been very, very poor. Uh, so I remember I got paid the equivalent of about uh, $40 in dollars and 30 something pounds uh, a week and 25 went on food and five went on a phone card to call my girlfriend every week and then we were given a car and we were given uh, an apartment to live in and that was my entire year that was that was it kind of thing yeah yeah so then I did two years in Lille uh, close to the Belgian border, that's very northern France. Sure. And then I did two years in the Alsace region near to the Swiss border, which I loved. Um, I really started, I started to speak French and I could get on and make friends, which was always obviously very difficult if you don't speak the language. But also, like I'd started to, you know, get recognized as someone with a bit of potential and, and talent. And therefore, from my French teammates, I was, you know, embraced a bit more into the, into the team because... I could actually be of value. Whereas there's this weird kind of no win situation when you go and race in France. If you're not good enough, they wonder why you're there. If you're good enough, then they get competitive with you about you're going to take their spot kind of thing. Sure. So it is a bit cutthroat and it's a little bit, you know, high competitive uh, atmosphere. But I mean, that just goes with the territory. So I, d I didn't really, I wasn't really bothered about that. Right, right. Um, what was your fondest memory living with Bradley Wiggins at 19? Uh, fondest memory. I mean, that was quite a hard year. I wouldn't say there was many fond memories. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's funny. So without jumping ahead too much, but to illustrate what I mean, the, my career was divided into two halves. Uh, the first half was from probably 17 when I was part of the GB team up until 26. And I finished that first half of my career with the Commonwealth Games in Melbourne in 2006, cool. uh, 25th of March. And the second half of my career started in the beginning of 2009 and continued all the way to the end of 2016 when I did my last race competitively. And the first half of my career was very much trying to fulfill my potential, feeling the pressure of my young, young adult ambition, probably born from a teenage fantasy of winning the Tour de France, winning stages, winning the world, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that really put a lot of pressure on me. I, I put a lot of pressure on myself and I can only say that looking back now 20 years later i didn't i wasn't enjoying cycling i wasn't cycling because i enjoyed it i was riding because i was trying to ride away from my upbringing and my sort of poverty sort of beginnings and um and this was definitely achieving that so that was good but i was kind of a bit distracted you know i wasn't riding for the right reasons i was riding for pure ambition for pure sort of status for for trying to make some money and all that kind of stuff and then when I came back in the second half of my career, it's like when you're 30, I was 29 when I started again for the second half. When you're 30, as, a, as an athlete, you're, you're kind of where you are. So there's no more potential. You are as good as you are. Right. You get signed for what you can do today, not what you might be able to do in five years time. Whereas if you're 19, you get signed for where you're going to be in, uh, in five years time. And then you're, you feel the pressure of having to achieve that. And sometimes it's realistic and sometimes it's not realistic. So the first half of my career and including the year that you referenced there with Bradley was very much part of that. So I look back on it with sort of slightly bitter taste in my mouth that I was just naive. I was 
riding for reasons that I thought were the right reasons, but they turned out probably weren't. And it definitely curbed my enjoyment for what I now enjoy far more as an adult with a much more mature outlook on life and um, of my own uh, objectives and, you know, ambitions. They're much more measured. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, hindsight being 2020, right? You know, and it's so important. Um, But you quit, right, when you're 26. And and I think you've used the term to sort of reinvent yourself. What, what, What prompted that decision to stop at 26? Uh, really simple i was not making i was not getting the contract value that i felt like i deserved i I was not getting the contract value that was going to give me financial security and the luxury of being able to choose what to do next after my career which i always thought from the beginning would end around the age it did which is uh, 36 37 but i hadn't anticipated the gap in the middle of three seasons where i didn't race properly right Um, and so i was like well i'm not gonna I'm going to have to reinvent myself either now or in 10 years. Like it's going to be harder in 10 years when I'm just even more institutionalized into cycling and sport with no experience outside of that. You know, I barely paid an electric bill or a, or a gas bill or, you know, anything um, up until the 20, 26, 27. Wow. So I just felt like I was kind of backing myself into a corner every year that I stayed doing that. And if, if you come out the other end, you know, with a couple of million in the bank and you can relax, then yeah, that's maybe the paycheck's worth it. But I definitely wasn't going to do that. So I just made the decision. I'd rather call it now. I actually stopped without any intention to come back again. Um, I'll reinvent myself. I'll get a job. You know, I back myself to find something to do and to do it well. And I just thought, right, I'll just, I'll do that. And actually it was a really difficult time. I would say, um, I, I didn't realize how much of my own identity had become attached to being an athlete and to being an athlete of a level, not a huge, not a massive level, but a level of notoriety and of recognition. And when that went away, no one knew who I was. No one asked how I trained for something, you know, and that was a big shock to the system, which in hindsight, again, was definitely the right thing to do to call it at the time, get a bit of a reality check on the rest of life. It's not all about cycling. And there is a life you have to leave when you, once you've finished. And it's quite a long time between retiring from a sports career and then, you know, retiring properly. Sure. Um, I, 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 took a, uh, I took a smaller pill to swallow at 26 than it would have been at 36 for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of pro athletes have that same sort of conundrum of, of losing themselves and oftentimes ends up in the chair of, of a psychiatrist's office as a result. <laughs> Um, but, um, I, mean, I agree. And, and you, you know, it's almost harder, the more successful you are. Oh, hundred you percent. You're never going to like, for me, I felt like I hadn't really lost anything cause I hadn't gained anything. I hadn't got where I really wanted to. I hadn't signed a world tour contract, but, um, if you have, and you're getting paid good money and it's like, well, you stay where you are, you, yeah. you're not going to throw that away kind of thing. So yeah. Um, and I do see that now with some of my peers, you know, for a long time, I felt like a failure. I don't anymore. Uh, for a long time, <laughs> good. I felt like a failure in that. I hadn't achieved my original cycling goals and I'd seen some of my peers of the same age and generation achieve a huge amount. But now at 40, I'm 40 years old now. um, Again, just looking at my life trajectory and their life trajectory, I'm in a much more stable place than many of my peers who who either have retired recently or retiring kind of around now. Um, And it's not such an easy it's not such a quick thing to say, oh, I wish I'd kind of had that type of career up until now rather than the, the life that I've led, which has just required me to be a bit more creative, uh, reinvent myself and, you know, look, look more outside of sport for what's going on. How does life work? What do I need to do about it? How am I going to achieve and succeed in my objectives? Sure. So at 26, did you leave knowing that you had the idea of starting an apparel brand or no, not at all? So why did you start Lacole? Uh, good question. So, I mean, I just, I, I didn't realize this. I've, I'm like, I describe myself as an entrepreneur, like really through and through very creative, um, an appetite for risk that is above the ordinary and average, just, just because that's a personality type. Sure. And, and also like, can I swear on this? <laughs> <laughs> you could, yes, yeah, is your time. Okay, so, so I mean, the reason I, I call this out now is a lot of my ambition is about saying fuck you to people who didn't believe I could do it. 
Yeah. I've spoken to a few entrepreneurs and, you know, people that have founded businesses and it's a common trait. <laughs> I store that up. Anyone who says you can't do that, like I store that up, that just that just turns into fuel for me to prove the world wrong. And it started with an ex girlfriend of mine, her parents said, Oh, you'll never make anything of yourself if you don't get an education. So I don't have an education. And I and I didn't realise how much I took that personally to go, you know, fuck you, watch this. You yeah. know, I'm gonna make something happen here. And, um, yeah, so, uh, so what was the question again? Oh yeah. So uh, I didn't well, just why you started it and it was really the proverbial fuck you. And I, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't, I didn't really know what to do, but I, so the reason I mentioned that is I have quite a methodical approach to things. So I went through an analytical process of what do I know? What can I transfer? What could I, how can I make the most of what I've gathered in insight and understanding and experience already? And how can I make that worth something in the next thing that I do? Hmm. So going through that process, obviously I know about cycling. I know about physiology. I know about coaching. I know about psychology. I know about apparel. I know about bikes, kit, wheels. Um, and so I went through a bunch of scenarios looking at, could it be this? Could it be that? And then I settled on looking back again, you know, quite a long time. I, settled on something that intuitively felt like it was scalable the the bit that i knew was worth something but the bit that i didn't know i felt like i could learn quite quickly quite quickly sure yeah and um and it felt like it had the most potential from a business point of view not from a product or not from a satisfying my own need to feel like i'm an, i'm good at something yeah. so this is a weird thing as well like real strength is not being good at the thing all the time real strength is knowing that you can learn and that's okay and to be in a place of unknowing or in a place of, I literally do not have a clue what to do, but I'm going to sit here and I'm going to Google or research until I know what the answer is. And I'm not leaving until that's happened. Like yeah. that's something that I've always been quite comfortable with. So as an, as an alternative example, I know people who've gone through higher education and some of them work in my business. I won't name names. Um, and, uh, and I think their, their, their education is almost, led them to believe they know the answer so they're no longer asking the question how can i make this better because they're right. like no, no i know the answer to this well they may know some of the answer or they may know an aspect of the answer but life is like if you keep looking you keep finding that's a fact yeah so as soon as you kind of approach something with oh, i know what the answer is then you just cut off the new learning the insight the experience the understanding yeah. that is almost infinite on most things basically it's just you just yeah. keep going yeah, yeah, and especially when you're when you're talking anything that involves technology, right? Like, because in the apparel market, for example, and I, I want to touch on this later, these are all very technical fabrics, you know, as far as moisture wicking or aero or what have you. I mean, if you go ahead and approach a subject like that, like you know everything, you might as well quit, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but you uh, but you say that, but I think you'd be surprised how many people do approach what they do with that, like often from an insecurity of. I need to feel like I'm good at something so I can go to sleep at night and feel proud of myself. Well, that's not like, <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't, it's a it's, losing battle. It's got a ceiling on it. It's got a ceiling for, for where you're going with it basically. So sure. yeah, I mean, so, so when I came to the analyzing all the options, it was, you know, it was really like, yeah, I can do this. And you know, I was more naive than I was brave. If I'd have known what I've called on myself to deliver at the time I started, I would never have had the courage to literally jump without knowing how to fly and start flapping on the way down and hope I, you know, work it out. Have a soft landing. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely what it felt like for a long time. So did you launch LeCole with like one jersey, one bib? Or like what was that first product assortment? Um, I actually launched in the winter, so winter fall of 2009-10, like mm -hmm. with some real test products. And I had probably four or five garments, long sleeve, short sleeve, Shorts, tights, and a gilet. Nice. Yeah. All black. Yeah. Oh, of course. Uh, white shoes. Uh <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, what, uh, so did you design the items or did you hire out yeah. a designer? Or like, how did you know? No. Did you know anything about pattern making or like? So what I did was I designed everything, but I kind of, I designed in a way that I could design without qualifications, uh, without needing to know patterns. So yeah. I approached a number of different factories to deliver samples. And then I basically adjusted everything like pocket height, pocket depth, stretch, um, sewing, um, thread type, like uh, collar height, collar linings, like everything, 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 everything. Sure. And I remember the first couple of times at the factory that I chose, which was in Italy, 
like my head would almost explode on a short sleeve jersey with a number of options if you start going with you know 50 different zip options different zip heights collar heights pocket positions sleeve length sleeve tightness gripper types you know stretch um weight wicking moisture like all those characteristics all into just a short sleeve jersey yeah. and it was like my head was going to explode i remember now but i i basically like, sort of use the pivot of i know what i want this to achieve i know how high or how hard it is to you know reach things if they're not quite right or i know i want it to be aerodynamic i know i want it to wick i know i want it to perform well so i was like what's the best option for this what's the best option for that and one of the fundamental ways that i design is i ignore the cost in the beginning i'm like don't i don't want to hear about that for a minute i just want to design like the best thing after you go through a couple of stages of design you kind of have to bring in the commercial which is cost margin you know rrps um, you know, uh, price elasticity. So is the customer going to take this? Is there enough value in it? Sometimes it's better to put more value in a product and make it a higher price because people feel the value that you've given it than it is to go down and take despec something. So, um, yeah, it was, it was really, I mean, I'm quite commercial actually, it turns out, which I didn't realize before I started this business, but like my, my, my design, uh, influence now is probably more, the commercial side so i'm looking at margins i'm looking at volumes i'm looking at scalability i'm looking at economies of scale like all of those things within the products that we design because we've got really good designers they genuinely do a much better job so going back to you know you asking me did i do the designing yeah. in the beginning i did every single job in this business and then since then i've been employing people who do a much better job than i did <laughs> that's it's a very intelligent way to run a business <laughs> um how do you define your customer uh good question i mean so i was actually doing some research this morning on uh so a lot of my role as a ceo now is about the future of the business sure and what i was looking at is our eco credentials and our supply chain transparency so the reason I mention that now is I actually think that's a really key part of a demographic of customer that we connect to in that we are made in Italy. So European, very, you know, very tight supply chain. We're integrated business. So we own our own manufacturing. We employ good people. We pay good wages. We, we create good working environments. We know what that is. We control what that is. And more and more, I think that is a strong and prominent desire for people to know our customers to know that's where their goods are coming from and they can trust and rely on us as a business to do the right thing by our customers we're not just chasing every penny in every you know in every garment we we want to make sure everyone's got the right amount in the supply chain we don't squeeze people beyond what's what's fair just because we could or or whatever yeah so um and i see that as becoming more and more relevant as um as time goes on. So I read a really interesting quote just this morning, which I really resonated with, which is transparency is the new organic. Oh, sure. And I really yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, I think, you know, websites are a plenty that disclose where their stuff's, you know, being made and where it's grown, you know, if it's a, it's a, you know, fiber yeah. material or what have you. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. It's not reached peak yet. I mean, everybody's no, no, going to have to start sharing. So, that what's stuff. interesting is, I mean, this is this is interesting to me. We have an eco range in like a few products that are recycled, you know, much more uh, eco friendly, but they're not the main garments. Right. They don't sell that well. So, this is interesting to me because I feel responsible as a business owner to investigate and be a responsible. Um, you know, eco-friendly. I don't want to like, I'm not an evangelist, so I'm not on a mission, but. Right, right. No, I know what you mean. But there's just the right thing to do, you know? Yeah, of course. So we've actually, we've actually got an approach in the next couple of seasons, which is use the eco credential, use those fabrics. There, there's no compromise in, in performance. There's no compromise in the technical ability uh, of those garments to deliver a very highly functioning, um, you know, uh, performance apparel. But we don't need to call it in the headline. It will just be in the copy. Say, We're just doing the right thing. Yeah. If you make it a footnote as opposed to the headline, I think that that's the good approach. And the other great thing that you can do, not you personally, but businesses, if you want to be more eco-friendly, one of the biggest things you can do is packaging. 
like use recycled material or upcycled material or anything like that for packaging. And I mean, that's, that's huge. Um, going back to the technical where sort of comment I was making where tech in, in sort of like your industry, right. Where things are performance fabrics and those types of tech allows you your competitive advantage. Right. Um, it's almost like kind of developing a formula one car in a way, because like, how do you work how do you handle that when your competition's trying to do the same? Like when you're moving the ball down the field, everybody's trying to become better at tech. So how do you, how do you take that on? I mean, that's a really, that's actually a really good question, I think. And my opinion is it's only temporary. Yeah. It's only with us temporarily. So I'm not trying to protect it forever and I'm not interested in, you know, IP, you know, protection right. and all that kind of stuff like it's fashion ultimately and as soon as it's out in the market it can be copied and it will and if it's good it should you know i copied stuff in the past that's how you know we made sure we were getting it's like to catch up you've got to know where where it is you know where the front is fair um so but i, I was going to say while you were talking is also quite exciting for me now we're a size where we can approach our fabric suppliers and say hey we're we're interested in something that does a little bit of this and a little bit of that it's this fabric yeah. and this fabric combined can you do that and you know if you did we would order enough to make it worth your while. Whereas up until recently, that was just never an option. So you had to get what was available. Yeah. So, so now it's quite interesting because we have fabrics that will come out in the range that had never been used, seen before, but deliver a really precise functional feature that I think is incredible and amazing. And, you know, next winter, whoever else found it could use it. That's fine. Right, right. You know, I'm, I'm really focused on our business. Like I'm not looking out there. I'm not looking at what Rafa's doing or Rassos or Castelli. I, I honestly don't care. I want our product to be better than it was last year and the year before every single year without fail. That's my objective. If we hit that and to enough of a degree, like I don't mind about the rest. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really interesting how you compare that with your metrics used for success, right? Because it's either monetary or it's product based or, you know, and for, for you, I'm assuming there's a, a healthy combination of both. What, in terms of what my measure of success is? Yeah. As far as Lacole's success, not you personally. Yeah. Well, okay. So I do differentiate between the two, my success yeah. and Lacole's success. That's healthy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's important as well in that as a founder, your role is very fluid. Like I said, I did every single job in the beginning. I do almost no jobs now. Like, you know what I mean? Well, <laughs> I still do everything. <laughs> no, but it's cool. And, and so, but that's okay. And it's an interesting experience because I often get a lot of credit. People come to me and say, oh, it's amazing what you did. And, and it's like, hmm. you know, in reality, I had nothing to do with that. That was someone else's idea. I see the metrics on how well it performs. I get the reports every week. I know what's going on in the business. You know, I do get an opportunity to veto something or really invest into, you know, we're really going to push this one. But, right. you know, it, it, I hire good people. They come up with good ideas and they execute those ideas excellently. That is, that is my job, yeah. finding people to do that. So my success and local success has always been um, two very different subjects. So local, I've always, always, always made it clear that Lacole's success will be at the expense of any one person, including myself. Right. So I will, I will never be the person to hold this back. So I'm going to feed it the ingredients. I'm going to, I'm going to push as hard as I can to get it off the ground. And then after that, you know, I want to hire people who are going to keep pushing as hard as they can to get it as high as it can go. Sure. Like that. I, I will police that, that characteristic within the business, like with my life almost, Do you know what I mean? Like i I take that really seriously. Yeah. And, and I even said that to my directors. So the three directors at the call, um, we run the business equally. No one has a bigger say than the other. Um, oh really? You know, we're, we're really balanced in that way. So it's a really nice experience. I, I used to own hundred percent. I don't anymore. And I wouldn't want to, I need my directors with the skin in the game to care enough, invest enough, push enough, work out the answers and try hard enough to make sure, you know, we make, we make a success of it kind of thing. Yeah. And the stress of that on your own would just be too much, you know? Yeah. 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 Very taxing. So that's, that's Lacole. And then for me personally, and I'll reference back my childhood again, like, uh, like in lots of ways I've made it so I can relax. You right. Know? And, and that detachment also allows me to be really objective. It's not about my interest. It's not about my, 
success or my credibility like that's done and just in not going bust pretty much was <laughs> right protect it yeah yeah exactly and for five years i think i went to bed every night thinking we could go bust tomorrow right you know for five years every single night and for many of those five years if the business went bust my, i was so heavily personally invested i would have been bankrupt so that was a bit of a weight on my shoulders and not something that i'd want to really do again right right sure yeah you know that's a that's a heavy weight for sure um I, I wanted to talk to you about how you are a vertical company and you do own your factory um that must have been a crazy leap of faith buying a factory was it not i mean apparently you were working with this factory the factory was maybe not doing great on maybe on the organizational or structural side of the business you went in, swept them up and said, okay, well, here's my cash. I own you now. <laughs> I mean, is that, is that virtually how it went? Literally, that's exactly how it worked. Yeah. I what was that it's, like? It's completely mad and a complete miracle at the same time that yeah. one, I chose to do that. Two, I managed to pull it off. And three, that it's formed such a pillar of what this business is and why it's so different. You know, yeah. we are unique as a business because like Rafa, we own the front end with a brand with a marketing, with a message, with a beautiful product, well presented. But unlike Rafa, more like Nalini, Castelli, um, on the older fashion brands, we also are the back end, the supply, uh, the manufacturing, the design, the innovation, and everything in the middle. I, I, I actually sit very centrally within the business, as in I'm monitoring demand and supply right. and keeping the balance, which yeah. is never in balance. You know, it's yeah. either always too much <laughs> supply or too little demand, or you know what I mean, or, or the other way around. So um, there's a constant requirement to go up and adjust and calm down, calm down or push, push, push. You know, we've got good demand. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to keep, keep it all, all joined up and stop people getting upset in the middle who are like, you know, it's too much. <laughs> well, and you, and you somewhat had to grow into the factory, right? So the early days of owning it, the factory, I'm assuming, was producing products for other brands as well or no? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So they had, um, you know, nearly a million euros of external business that wasn't ours wow um and i kind of recognized that i wanted to i wanted to build my own business as a as a requirement of their sort of monthly output so however many units they could produce i wanted to be a bigger proportion to lacole oh sure um and then there's a choice between do we just keep the external business or do we sort of bring that down gently while we bring this one up um as it happened the external business was going down anyway. So I always was on a bit of a clock cool. to get my business big enough to, to sustain the requirements of how much feeding that factory needed to justify itself. Now, was that pressure or no? Yeah. Like huge, immense, pressure. immense pressure. Yeah. 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 Like, like really, really, really serious <laughs> pressure yeah. to the point where, you know, I mean, I must have been really keen yeah. <laughs> 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 or stupid. I don't know. Maybe I was stupid, but well, I think I think that to your earlier point, like being naive sometimes is an advantage. Yeah, I think it's like famous people like Richard Branson have said things like that. If I knew that, if I knew it was going to be this hard, I never would have done it. But I didn't know, and I did. And once I started, it was too late to stop. So I just there was only one direction to push, and that was make it work. I'd like to take a minute to thank you for listening to the Standard Age podcast. It's certainly been a lot of fun sharing each guest's story, even during the craziest of times over the last year. The good news is it's allowed me to further focus on some of the elements that make Standard Age possible. I've done a ton of product development, some items for well over a year. If you'd like to support the podcast, the least expensive way is to simply rate and review the show on whatever platform you're on. Further, you can visit standard-h.com where you can purchase the brand's apparel or directly support the podcast under the accessories tab. I can't thank you guys enough for listening to the show and for all of your support, especially through social media. It's been so much fun interacting with you and all of the great feedback has been wonderful, so thank you. So many of you are into watches, whether you are just starting to collect them or if you're already in deep in discussing the extensive finishing of the movements. In fact, my most listened to episodes have been watch related. For those of you interested in independent watch companies, Passion Fine Jewelry in Solana Beach, California might just have what you're looking for. Previous listeners may be familiar with owner Tim Jackson from episode one of the Standard Age podcast. 
He and his team are certainly a wealth of information while offering incredible customer service. Tim and his team are quite literally made up of family and friends, so I'm confident you'll feel very much a part of their community even if it's your first visit. Of course, if California is out of reach, definitely visit passionfinejewelry.com for more information. Or visit Tim's blog, Independent in Time, for a deeper watch dive. Now let's get back to the show. If we could touch on marketing for a second. Early days, it was just you, right? Riding as the face of LaCole. Yeah. Um, later, you made a pretty significant hire on the marketing front. What did that allow the company to do as a company by making, you know, hiring a marketing director? Well, I, uh, it's going to sound weird or like a bit crazy that someone this naive was starting a business, but my belief before I started was, or as I, at the beginning was I'll make the best product and people will buy it because it's the best. If you build it, they will come. Yeah, but that's not true. I mean, if you're Rafa spending five million pounds on marketing or ASOS with 30 years of, you know, recognition in the market, like no one's going to believe a brand new little tiny startup who's only got four products on the website anyway. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it was fantasy, complete madness to think that that was actually going to work. So right, right. No matter, like no matter how many friends you have. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, I had a really good conversion rate of selling kit to people that I met because I would feed them my passion, my enthusiasm, my future, yes. our potential, where we're going, where it's come from, what, you know, our credentials, but I can't, you can't do that to every single person. And the proximity of that person, as they get further and further away from you, become harder and harder to one, get their attention and two, make them listen to the point they believe, like that's what marketing is. Right. So yeah, so we made, so that realization was a nasty reality check that meant, I needed to work out the answer, which I did not know anything about. And I had, so I went to buy the factory with a guy who turned out he was, um, he was a seed investor. So when I bought the factory, I did a third, a third, a third, my savings bank loan seed investment. Mm. And, um, and I did that seed investment with, uh, my first, basically my first investor who's a chap called Lee, who's a really, really fantastic guy. And, I mean, part of the miracle is I convinced him to still put his money in after he went to visit the factory in Italy. <laughs> right, right. And he's still committed. <laughs> but, um, but the reason why I was mentioning that is we then decided we needed to raise a probably more significant amount of money and that needed to be a marketing play. As in, we had the factory, we had good product, we just needed to tell more people about it and that was the next phase of the business. So we set out to raise a million pounds on crowdcube that was that was the uh the platform so that's i think that's that's relevant to you guys as well in america there's a crowdcube platform so crowdfunding sure. yep and um and off the back of that we would hire a marketing director and then begin a fairly you know aggressive marketing push to attract the right amount of attention to the products that we were already producing so was that verbiage stated in your crowdfund saying like, we need the money to hire a marketing guru? <laughs> uh, I don't think it was a direct, I think it was like expansion. So yeah, yeah, we've got the structure, we've got the capacity, we've got the product, we get great reviews, we just need to tell more people about it. So this is the phase we're in. And mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't know that I was gonna hire that marketing director, Simon, uh, at the beginning of starting the crowdfunding. I just knew I needed that, that, that element yeah yeah and that w i would work it out between now and then i don't know <laughs> so how'd you find simon then how'd you connect so simon was so the reason i mentioned lee is simon was a connection of lee's um he worked at sky so a massive business and right um he was he was on an earn out so that would time nicely with where we were going to need to start with him and um, he came in, he was looking for something really entrepreneurial, something that he could be, you know, senior in, something that he could really make a difference on. Yeah. And I think we fit that and we got on well. So personally, we were, you know, good, good chemistry. And like he's turned out to be a, a real machine and an, an absolute engine in what we've achieved since 2017, 2017. Um, we started that Crowdcube in the end of 2016, finished it in the beginning of 2017, and then Simon started later that year. Sure. And, um, you know, because when you come from Sky, which is, I don't know, a billion pound business owned by the Murdochs, he, you have a, he had a 60 man team, you know, working for him. So he was going to be the only person in marketing. 
he's going to have to roll his sleeves up, get back down to the coal face and really, you know, grind it out kind of thing until we become a bit bigger and we can start to employ people, which we do now. And it's all a lot more like he's used to. So he was hired as a full-time employee on day one. Yeah. So not a project basis. With no, with no department. Like, it's you. Here's the money. Make it work. Because if you don't, we're all going home. So he, did he get equity at all or was it just yeah, like, yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So we had a deal, you know, part equity, part, um, uh, part salary. And we worked it out. We came to a, an agreement, which, you know, it, in lots of ways, he took a massive, massive risk. Um, and, and convincing him to do that was really, you know, a big part of like, I have to, I take credit for that. That's a, that's yeah. a big thing for me. And, but we are now growing into him. That's really, that's the really lovely thing about it. So you know, we're now a business big enough to where we would probably more legitimately look at someone his size because in the beginning it's like you can't afford this person. You know, right. well, it's like buying a factory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's equal to that. It's exactly yeah. equal to that. Yeah, and and uh, lots of people were like, "Nah, that, that's wrong. That's the wrong thing to do." And then that's just me, like that's fuel for later. All right, calm down. Well, that's got to be somewhat of a pat on the back for yourself too that he would even consider it, let alone join the team. No. Yeah, uh, I mean, I I don't know what I said to you know get to convince him, <laughs> make him believe. Yeah, because you know he was turning down really really serious offers at other companies. You know, like massive multi multi conglomerate companies, and and some of, I'm sure some of the people he knew were like, uh, are you are you, are you sure? Yeah, yeah, but it's worked, so it's it's good. So, what has proven to be the most effective form of marketing for you guys, especially these days? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, we I mean, marketing is a dark art and even a very deeply analytical data driven marketing department like we have is still you're still sort of guessing in the dark about how much of a difference did that actually make because Mm -hmm. it's never it's never happening in isolation and what's really interesting about marketing is you have to choose activity relative to your size and there's this like sweet spot because for instance if you turn over Two hundred and fifty thousand pounds. You can't do TV marketing, like you know what I mean. Right. It just this is so far apart. So you end up looking for, and this is something I'm I've learned and gleaned sort of in the last couple of years is, you have to look for the thing that's going to just get you that next step, and then you qualify to go the next step. So you kind of you spend you know you spend a hundred thousand pounds on marketing, then you spend two hundred thousand pounds on marketing, then you spend three. You can't go from Ten grand on marketing to a million pounds on marketing. You, Overnight, you have to build yeah. it up gently and slowly, and track it along the way. Otherwise, you get lost in. You're just wasting money. You're burning it, and it's not doing anything. But you don't know because you did a whole bunch of things in uh, simultaneously, and you don't know which one worked and which one didn't work. Sure. So, so I'm just got kind of giving you a little bit of background around. It's a difficult question to answer, but we are very data driven, very digital. So we we like you know measure the clicks. Um, old-fashioned marketing of uh, magazine advertising and that kind of thing is almost like it's irrelevant you can't if you can't measure it you're guessing if you're guessing if you got it right you could never do it again and if you got it wrong you don't know what was wrong about it kind of thing yeah that's fair so um so we have um we have like we we also segment our database into a number of different um categories we have database who've never made an order and they get treated in a certain way they get a whole email journey educating them explaining why we're good uh you know why they should consider us next time they want to make a purchase how we've worked hard on this product and that product and we're trustworthy if they've never heard of us before and you know we'll dispatch and fulfill reliably and all that kind of stuff like it's just little things that so how do you grab those email addresses then are those the people that are just signing up on your website you're like oh new address let's send them the journey exactly and they get automatically into new address first journey go through here then when they've made an order then you're trying to get people to come back and make another order, you know, and I don't mean to sound cynical about it, but you're trying to make people sticky, like they loyal and um, they trust. And why would they go anywhere else? They get a great product, a great service. It's the passion, right? And how do you communicate passion when you're not having this conversation? You have to have like a legible, a legible conversation of passion, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So so the reason why you kind of explain those things is then we track every single metric across when their first interaction, whether it was from the website, from our Eurosport advertising, from our Strava campaigns, you know, from whatever, and we track them all the way through and we know exactly where they drop out, exactly how long they take between, right. you know, no order to first order, first order to second order, and then 
you know, what's effective. So let's adjust this, let's adjust that. Too many emails, too many unsubscribes. Okay, so let's stop that, calm, calm down a little bit. Or, yeah. you know, you know, there's lots of there's lots and lots of different things. So yeah, it's it's a it's a constantly uh, evolving process as well, I would say. Yeah, it's a moving target for sure. What um so how do you set goals these days for Lacole then? Is it more product based or is it more monetary based? I mean, I'm sure you're looking at sales. We sort of touched on this a little bit earlier, but Yeah. Is it expansion of assortment? Like, how do you set the goal here? Yeah, I mean, okay, so if I go back a little bit further, right, instead of answering that question, because that question would be quite different. There's a different answer depending on which point in time you, you ask me about. Of course. So in the beginning, it was all about making good product. Yeah. And then it transferred really, like, sort of a complete 180 away from product. Like, that's good enough. That, that box is ticked for a while. Now it's about marketing. And like, how do we, how do we do that and um, generate demand? And then it's, um, you know, supply, how we, how we building that to make sure we keep up with demand. Mm -hmm. And then, um, then there's product expansion, then there's geographical expansion, then there's consolidation. So like, let's calm down on our range expansion. Let's just keep that the same for a while. Pretty tight. Yeah. It's things like your proportion of new and returning customer ratios you would use as, okay, we really need to expand something now because we need to freshen this up for there's too many you know uh returning customers but they're not you know they're not buying as much or i don't know whatever but you use that as like a reference to give you a bit of a guide on um and you know how it's going and then you've got margin targets then you've got revenue targets then you've got channel targets you know so actually what you end up building is this like really homogenized holistic picture of the business what's performing well what could be improved a bit like fitness actually yeah sorry uh the way that fitness works with finance they operate in identical graphs so if you train hard you get fitter and you can do more like that's that's how it works if you work hard you know you get more money and you invest more and it turns into more and, it, and it's a fulfilling sort of prophecy like that yeah so so now you know we have a finance department that looks at all the margins all the forecasts all the everything we have a procurement and like a COO who, who leads the department on making sure that we purchase at a lower unit cost and we, we access the economies of scale and um, you know, all those kind of things. And then we have marketing saying, Hey, I think we could probably introduce a new product at this price point. It fits between the range nicely here and here. And it's something that I think would be, you know, would fill the gap that is currently kind of missing if you like. And yeah, you kind of need, to understand that each product will sell within a proportion of the entire sales. Mm -hmm. So I mean that by you can't introduce too many products too soon because you'll spread it too thinly and keeping track of your product, uh, your, your cash tied up in stock is one of the single most important um, like subjects within a business like ours because really really quickly you could get choked up on no cash too much stock not selling through the wrong stock you know wrong sizes wrong color i don't know whatever and the analytics that goes into getting that right is is intense <laughs> do you guys orchestrate any pre-order situation for that on that note yes and we didn't until this year but with uh so with the virus situation we we were shut for seven weeks in italy and in that time, demand went absolutely mental, like yeah. I'm sure most of the cycling, uh, at least online cycling, recognized. Sure. And, and then we were like, we, we almost cannot produce it fast enough to catch up because every month uh, we were doing enough for the month before, it had gone on a month and that was up again. Yeah. And I was I, like, it's a good problem. I'm not, I'm not complaining about it, but right, it, right, it was right. still a problem. Yeah. yeah. And the risk you have in that situation is you're actually upsetting a lot of people. Whereas when you're small, and you know it's a problem it's like when you're a small business the problems are small when you're a bigger business the problems are bigger so yeah yeah, yeah. then you get customer service noise then you get a massive backlog of unhappy people if you get it wrong and like it really spirals out of control very quickly right. but we introduced pre-order um we had people waiting eight nine weeks for products that they had paid for up front so from a cash flow perspective it was incredible from a loyalty demonstration from a customer willing to put their money down and wait two months that was also incredible as an indicator of you know the type of type of um i mean i think slightly unique circumstances people were willing to do that because it was fairly unusual 
and sure. a lot of places were suffering with supply. So, um, you know, maybe there's a little bit of that, but actually I was really, I was really pleased to see people were, were willing to do that. Um, don't take it for granted, but at the same time, we, we took quite a lot more sales because we accepted a pre-order um, rather than only selling stock that was actually in the warehouse and ready to be dispatched. Yeah. What, um, what advice would you give to those looking to expand into international distribution? Because you've done that, obviously, um, with the United States over the last few years. I'm sure you're wide, widely assorted over uh, or widely distributed over um, Europe. What well, yeah, advice I mean, do you have for international? Do you mean supply internationally or do you mean create the demand internationally? Because they're very well, different. Yeah, both. Sure. I mean, the way we do a lot of our international recognition from, so from a first touch point or a customer recognizing us as a brand for the first time, things like platforms like Strava. So, you know, activity apps, they've, they've been really good. Garmin Connect, that kind of thing. Uh, they're global and you tap into an audience who you know is keen on exercise. You know, it might not be your activity, less it might be running instead of cycling, but you know you're into a hotbed of, um, you know, keen and interested people who will require the kit and the equipment to do their, their activity. So yeah. that's been a good one. Um, I mean, the team as well. I mean, this is probably a little bit later on, but uh, having a world tour team as a project is globally recognized as everyone's watching the Tour de France or at least when you sponsor a team it's not like like i don't know if you would be able to tell me what what kit was sam bennett wearing who made who makes <laughs> right 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 yeah can you tell me sam bennett um i no no which is funny because like i, I know sky was rafa for years right and then then i i only noticed maybe last year i was oh, like yeah. wait that's not a rafa kit no so <laughs> so uh the reason why that's interesting is you know because of the brand themselves told you, not because they were on the jersey and you were watching a race and then you saw and you were like, ah, oh, because there's loads of jerseys. There's loads of, like, so the reason I'm pointing it out is the value of that project or that um, uh, investment is only as big as you're then activating it. Right. Their uh, quick step is made by Vermark. Vermark is a little European brand who actually don't do a lot of direct to consumer digital marketing or advertising or they have more custom wear. So wow. they're selling to clubs and teams and events. They don't really do, they're not a modern business. They don't have a brand that they're really amplifying and then using the team to amplify. So, so Rafa did a really good job and a really good example of how you do it well. And then with EF, they're even bigger. So they're also the content partner, which is, you know, they're central to all the media, the reach that they generate for all the partners and all the team sponsors. Um, and that's something that we're quite focused on around it's not good enough just to put your logo on the on the kit. You need to then talk to people about it, activate it, engage people. So we have the UK only. We have um, ad bumpers on the Eurosport coverage of the Tour de France. And we'll do the same for the Giro and the Volta. So while we've got the team in the race, we've also then got the ad bumper. So it's like, hey, Lacole makes, you know, Bahrain McLaren's kit. Yeah, I was going to say, for those listening, it's the Barry McLaren kit for sure, which McLaren's dipping out next year, are they not? Yes, they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a symptom of virus and challenges and obviously cash and finances. But that's not going to affect you guys, is it? Uh, I don't know. I think there's still a bit of a question mark around what they're actually going to be able to do, you know, whether Bahrain's going to step up and be the next, you know, the fill in the gap or I don't know yet. So there's still a little bit of a um question mark around that that team and the project and everything but cool we'll, we'll take it as it comes you know whatever it is we you know we it's not the only thing we do and you know we are we are trying to be a performance brand so it's important that we have uh, that presence in the world tour but you know it, it's not the only thing and there's there's plenty to go out we we really have a lot of momentum as a company so um, i'm quite excited about what we can achieve anyway in lots of ways sure how do the emotional stresses compare and or differ between being a professional cyclist and being a business owner? Hmm. Interesting. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that before. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's worse and harder in business, but only at a certain phase. So up until about 18 months ago, I would say it was for five or six years, it was much, much harder in business than any stress or strain in 
in sport. Is that due to hours being worked or financial stresses or what, what, it, what was it that was doing it? No, and I've, I've analyzed, I've processed this a lot because I didn't start a business just to make money. I started a business to enjoy and, yeah. and make a contribution to the world. So yes. if I hate my job because it's too stressful, then <clears throat> there's no, why am I that? Yeah, exactly. So, so I was going like, I need to, I need to get my head around this cause I need to enjoy this. And I'm, I'm willing to accept a bit of investment and um, for a time I'm going to learn. So that's why it's going to feel you know, more uncomfortable than it needed to be. But I need to get to an end game where this is fun and I enjoy coming to work, which I do now, by the way. Awesome. <laughs> and, and I think so one of the, one of the kind of really founding principles that I came to was action is the only antidote to stress. Right. So if you feel stress and you do nothing, the stress remains. If you feel stress and you do something about it, that is literally like medicine that is dissolving all of that stress. Biggest band-aid, yeah. Yeah, you're no longer focused on the stress, you're focused on what you're doing. So if in the very beginning someone said, it will take you this long to get to the stage we are, like let's say right now, yeah. I would have been really disappointed. I'm like, really? That's, that's ages away. <laughs> During the time of getting to where we are now, I was in, I was absolutely not looking at how long it's taking whatsoever. I was just looking at staying alive. Yeah. And that was 100% of my attention and focus. I didn't have anything left to go. Hmm, it's taken a couple of years too long. This, um, you know, I'm not happy about it. Yeah. I was just like, thank God I'm still here today right now. Yeah. And then it was like, back to the action. What do we do next? How do we, you know, how do we keep this alive? How do we push this along? How do we get it across the line? Yeah. Well, speaking of like what to do next, the temptation for me, at least within standard age is like to just like expand the assortment and like slap a logo on this and like make that and make that like, how do you, how do you find that delicate balance as to how to grow your assortment? That's a, that is a really common desire. And I yeah. probably was victim of that myself in terms of trying to go too soon thinking. So, you know, when I said product uh, controlling your your inventory is absolutely critical like that can kill a business uh because about cash um that is so linked do you, do you remember a brand called vulpine i don't know so they and maybe that's were your a point brand. <laughs> yeah they were, british, they were a british brand but cycling so they were okay. a cycling brand i know about them and they were really prominent to me a few years ago because they did a crowd raise like we did and they raised double the amount they went out for in half the time they, in, they went out to raise it. And we raised just about the amount in double the time we intended, as in we had to look, ask for an extension. And I was like, this isn't fair, you know. <laughs> uh, we're better than them. And what, what's the difference, you know? But that success led them to make mistakes with expanding the range too much, going too heavy on stock without the, the demand or without the uh, assurance that they were going to actually sell it through. They weren't running the analytics, analytics properly. They were founded and led by someone too optimistic without someone pessimistic to just calm it down, rein it in, hold a second. Let's prove the concept or let's prove the new product before we just start buying thousands of them. Right. And like it, each little step, nothing by itself, but all added up together. It just choked that business and it ran out of money and it, and it went bust. Yeah, and um, it was bought for the inventory literally alone, which was I asked for the inventory list because we had an interest in you know what, how they did it and what they were doing, and they didn't have like loads of one product. It wasn't like they had thousands of anything, but they had thousands of options, and that was the problem. So they had two or three scattered around everywhere, and suddenly it was that was too much for them, and they couldn't support it, and they couldn't sell it through. So my recommendation is keep it focused, learn how to sell one thing well, Coca Cola. Yeah. 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 And once you get that right, that is basically the cookie cutting mechanism where then you expand and you do the analytics on why are we going to this new product? Why are we expanding in this direction instead of that direction? Prove that to me. Compel me to say, you've got three or four options. You're going to pick one. Why is that the best option? And yeah. if, you, if you go through that process, you're almost guaranteed to challenge yourself, guaranteed to ask the difficult questions, guaranteed to find the answers to the difficult questions before you committed. And so at least then you know the direction you're going in, the challenges of a type that you're gonna face and the answers of a variety that you're gonna have at your disposal to, to kind of get past that. Yeah, that's sound. I, th I think it's very sound. Uh, sensitive to your time. So um, just wrapping up real quickly, how often are you on the bike these days? Three or four times a week. Oh, not, what are you riding? Uh, I ride a Colnago. Uh, I've got two bikes. 
both Colnagos, C64 on a concept, which I love. And I am as much of a, a fan and an enthusiast of cycling now as I've ever been. Like, I oh, absolutely cool. love it. The tour was amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I watched as a fan, you know, I'm a re I'm, I love my sport. I love the industry that we work in. And uh, exercise for me is like a real release and fitness. I still fit into my wedding suit. Nice. You know, I'm a healthy shape. And yeah. that was mid-season while I was racing. So, you know, I, I don't look any different, I don't think. So what are your rides like? Are there cafe stops or are you still just in, in no. inhaling gels and riding so, for five hours? <laughs> very time poor. Okay. And I, I basically, I'm a competitive person who's managed to funnel all my competition into two uh, areas of life. Still cycling and, and work. So like, I want to beat Rafa, I want to beat Asos, I want to be bigger than them, I want to be the best, the biggest, the whatever. And, and then I, I also want to drop everyone. <laughs> <laughs> cycling and entrepreneurship are, are both quite tough. I think people can, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that that's the case. So I just want to finish on one little thing because I think you just reminded me of, a, of uh, like a advice I'd give someone. And sure, cycling is tough and business is tough. Tough only affects how you feel. It doesn't doesn't make any difference. It's just what it is. You know what I mean? It's a judgment. Right. Tough is a judgment. Right. So I, I really pride myself and I work hard to what I deliver at work every single day is the same. Whether I feel good, middle, bad, happy, sad, whatever. If you work for me, like you don't you don't really see the difference because my contribution is equal every day. And the same and on the bike, you know, if a lot of my young teammates would say, Oh, I, don't, I just don't feel motivated today. And I'm like, who cares? Fuck motivation. That's just a luxury. You know, you're, you're contracted. That's your job. End of the conversation. Right. Feel, if you feel motivated, happy days. If you don't, it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> Otherwise, you're coming, you're coming up and down with motivation. Like, you've got to do your job anyway. I've got to provide for my kids, regardless of whether I feel happy or sad. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, my last question was, was going to be the combination of that because cycling and entrepreneurship are both tough. Can you explain the value and the importance of challenging yourself? Yeah, I think that's about feeling alive, isn't it, for me? Mm. But I think that suits certain types of personalities more than others. So if I'll give you like a little, like a little kind of example. If someone says, I bet you can't do that, yeah. like that, that's like you're asking for it now yeah 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 exactly <laughs> that engages all the burners yeah exactly but so i have to be really careful like even to, to to the extent if my wife says you know she's playing me i'm like car i know what you're doing i'm not <laughs> reverse psychology i bet you can't do that right but it really is a big engine and so what the reason i kind of use that as an example is i think certain types of people like challenges you know i also have people that work for me who don't want to challenge they want to know reliably predictably to the minute what they're going to do every single day and they're going to come in do it and go home again some people are just happy being a cog exactly exactly you know? and it's fine it's not one is not better than the other it's just appropriateness to a certain position you know because 80 percent of my day most days i don't know what it's going to be right yeah but most people would get really stressed with the anxiety of what if it's bad and i'm like well if it's bad, I'll work it out. If it's good, I'll enjoy it. You know, right, those right. are the two options. Yeah. I, I think the lack of monotony for me is what keeps me going. Honestly, I just think not knowing is the best thing because then I'm never bored. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. But then that's good. I mean, you're, you kind of have that creative uh, founding characteristic. So no, we're, we're the same cloth. I know it already, you know? Yeah. Uh, and well, listen, Yanto, I really, really appreciate you taking the time. One of these days, I'm going to make it to England, and I would love to get on a bike ride with you. Yeah, uh, I'll get dropped, but that's fine. <laughs> you Honestly, we've got a really nice bunch of guys, and we can do a cafe stop. We don't have to absolutely drill it, and um, it'll be a real pleasure. Yeah, really, really good. Nice to speak to you. Please remember to send me the link. I'd love to, you know, absolutely we'll post it. And yeah, it's been a pleasure talking much. to you. Yeah, it's really good questions. Good luck. Thank you. Definitely. Cheers. Bye. Again, huge thanks to Yanto for the conversation. And I don't know about you guys, but listening to him truly makes me want to work even harder. As always, thank you to Jensen Reed and Super Beautiful for the theme track, as well as to Clear Audio for the noise-canceling headphones. Stay tuned for in two weeks' time will be another episode of the Standard Age Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>